Hello! And welcome to episode 3 of The Real Gambling Review, the betting podcast by the people who've torn up their tickets and blamed their own poor judgement, unlike most punters. But not all the time. It's a bonus podcast from Modern Media Review. I'm Robin Gibson. And I'm Sean Gulligley. And before we go on, don't forget to listen to our podcasts both Real Gambling Review and Modern Media Review on any platform you like these days, Spotify, Apple, Google, you name it, and on the website at modernmediareview.com. And subscribe and like us if you like us. But, um, well, dislike us if you want, I don't mind, as long as they subscribe. You can do a thumbs down as long as you still subscribe. <laughs> um, but, but today, as usual, we're going to be talking about the world of gambling until the fun stops, as the adverts put it in big letters. Do you think we repeat ourselves, Sean? No, never. It's the nature of gambling, isn't it, repeating you? It's almost like the, the ultimate example of those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Well, it, it could be that I'm repeating myself, but sometimes when you go into a bookies or you're putting your bet online and you know what you're doing is wrong, but like the whale that continues to beach himself after everyone puts him back into the water, you sometimes <laughs> can't help yourself. And I think I think you've been doing that last night, haven't you? Well, yeah, this is <laughs> it's, a, it's a football betting tragedy, really. And it points up a greater pathology among football punters that's well worth examining, which is... Um, the well, get-rich-quick syndrome. <laughs> yes, and I've been following Solihull Moors, uh, West Midlands team, <laughs> I, I believe, only because I have a few sort of friendly ties with them. And they've been absolutely romping it in the kind of early stages of the FA Cup. Previous round of the FA Cup, they tanked Oxford United. You don't mention Fair result. Oxford United, you know, 5-1. Yeah, so they were result. home to Rotherham in the second round last night, and... They were 11 to 10, I think, and I thought, now that's a really good bet, you know, shrewdly thinking. <laughs> Solly Hull, no, 11 to 10, that is Solly Hull Moors or the draw. And oh, thought, nice. That, that is a really good bet. And they had a ho- home draw, hadn't they? Yeah, and what do they do? Unlike, I mean, if someone gives you a, a horse they really fancy at 11 to 10, Sean, yeah. you don't start casting around for other horses to add into the bet, <laughs> do you? You go and back it. But Hopefully. what have we got here? I've gone, oh, I'll need to put something else in here to sort of bump up the winnings a bit and <laughs> cast around and came up with West Brom away at Preston, who were at shade of odds on. Well, in itself, not a bit of it. Preston v West Brom just screams draw to me. Without being an expert on Preston or West Brom, it just sounds like a draw, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, I, guess the only, I guess the only bonus was that you didn't do as I would do and try and find another five to put in with it. <laughs> but this is the problem, isn't it? So, you know, try and cut a very long and tragic story short. <laughs> I put them in a, this double. Solly Hull Moors go 3-0 up, and I'm quite happy. And then the West Brom game drags on and on and on right until nearly the end. There's no more cash. Cash outs dwindled away to nothing. <laughs> And I think I kind of switch off my phone and I'm walking out the door, nil nil at Preston, and uh, I think I'll just have a last look. I will look at the Preston West Brom game, and West Brom have scored in the ninety odd minute. I think, <laughs> yeah, I'm cashing out here. This is fantastic. Look at the other game, and it turns out that Rotherham have come back from three nil down to win four <laughs> three. And I just thought, what an absolute disaster. <laughs> and why do you do that? Why not have two bets? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's crazy. You would never do... I mean, OK, you occasionally put a horse in a horses in doubles or trebles, but it's not an automatic reaction to finding one you want to back. Whereas with football, I don't know what it is that makes you do this, but you think, oh, now I'm going to try and turn that into a treble. I, I think it goes back to the days... It's habit. Well, you had to have a treble in the old days, didn't you? Well, you couldn't get single bets on. I mean, hopefully some of our younger listeners will be flummoxed by that statement, but you couldn't have a single bet on football. Well, on the off chance there is a younger listener, <laughs> you, could, you couldn't have a single unless it was on TV, is that right? I think that was it, yeah. And then... If you wanted a treble, it had to be three away wins, didn't it? <laughs> and if you wanted any, you had to have three aways for a treble. But if you wanted any other, any homes in your bet, you had to have a five timer. That's not that long ago. I know. It reminds me of that quote you were saying from the bookies: "Do not regard this as an income." Yeah, don't look at betting as a source of income. <laughs> well, you certainly wouldn't be if you were doing five timers and eight acres uh, football matches, would you? And yet people do that, don't they? Well, I used to do it. You must. 
you must have done it on the way to football. I mean, in the way that people used to do the pools as well. It's like, you know, you do the pools a couple of nights before the weekend and you go off to the football thinking, you know, by six o'clock tonight, I'm going to be a millionaire. Oh, it's incredible. And the guys I go to football would still do loads of anchors on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very occasionally come up, but the amount of heartache it brings when someone... Ah, but yeah, the problem is you can be watching it. I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it, where you're sat down and it's, you know, 25 to 5 and the acker is in place and loading and you've, you know, mentally you're spending the money already and then probably about three of them go down in the 91st minute. I know, it's just, I just thought, well, here's a team of Solihull Moors who... I've been paying their way so far in these games and, and the last opportunity you had for them to pay their way in a cup match and they've gone and blown it. <laughs> Let you down massively. Yeah, I haven't blown it. They've gone and blown it. There's <laughs> another thing, and I, I, I'm no statistician, as you know, but ah. both of those games last night bore out what I always think about football betting is that the best thing to do is wait until 10 minutes from the end and then back the opposite of what's happening. <laughs> if someone's winning, just lay them, and if it's a draw, back either team to win, and so on. And it, I'm sure it's going to pay off in the end because the prices get really big. It's just a timer, isn't it? I, I think that that strategy is the sure road to profit because you know who needs <laughs> experts or statistics or anything like that when you've got your gut, mate. Well, it's a bit like compiling your own speed figures for racing, isn't it? It's going to be a wee bit time consuming. <laughs> Yes. I could go through it. Maybe if you just went through all the televised matches to see how many shock endings there were. Or just, why don't we carry on repeating the same mistakes? Well, yeah, talking of repeating ourselves, <laughs> maybe we should have a recap on what we've done before. We won't, Obviously, we won't talk about Strictly Come Dancing much. Well, I, I'm still a bit gutted about that. And I was chatting to um, a Strictly aficionado over the weekend who said that... Is that yourself? Yeah, obviously myself, talking in the mirror. And she was saying that it wasn't Saffron that was the problem. Saffron was a brilliant dancer. It's that people don't like AJ, her partner, as he's too smug, she said. Well, we don't like a smug dancer, do you? No, nothing, they don't like a smug dancer. There's nothing worse than a smug dancer. Yeah, with his smug face staring at you in the screen every Saturday night. Well, there were always a lot of them when I was a teenager. Smug dancers. <laughs> They'd always, they'd always do better in the pooling on the dance floor. The smug, so I don't know that it's true. I think people do like smug dancers. Sashaying around with their smug visage. Talking of which, Michelle Visage. She's out. Anyway, that favourite we were talking about, Kelvin Fletcher, he's gone, isn't he? Well, the difficulty is the second favourite, who was Kareem, is uh, the public don't seem to like him as he's continually in the, uh, in the dance-offs now. Oh, and he's being saved by the judges each time. So it's a death sentence for anyone else that goes in the uh, in the dance-offs because the judges are in love with him. OK, so there was never any way to make any money out of Strictly Come Dancing, was there? Not by backing who I liked, anyway. So don't think of that as an income in future. That was, a, that was, that was an outgoing. I never even backed any of them anyway. I just oh. ignored the whole thing. As I ignored I'm a Celebrity, which is just as well, because the one that I thought was a bit of a toughie, Adele Roberts, has got booted out really early on. First, I think. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't she was believe favorite, that. Wasn't, she was favourite to be first eviction. Ian Wright, right, right, was about 7-2 to two when they first kicked off, and he's 50s now. Yeah, well, we were right to say don't back it. Yeah, exactly. Well, because he did immediately start crying about having no food. Not only do people not like smug-faced dancers, although maybe in, in the Paisley Locarno they did. No one likes a crybaby in the jungle. I think I'd still be looking at Caitlyn Jenner at double-figure price. Still 16s, available at 16s. And it's an interesting one because she is famous. I mean, we were chatting about this in um, in the main podcast that we are tra- our first transatlantic Robin. Yeah, it was. We, people should listen to that. Our transatlantic podcast with Sean and Ben Diamond in New York made all the difference. It did make all the difference. We always sound better in New York. Strangely, it has um, helped my betting. Has it? Yeah. How? Well, well, because I bought the New York Times being in New York <laughs> yeah. and. Um, um, on the Monday, and I read a couple of pages about American football. So obviously, an American paper reading that has made me an expert. Okay, what do you think then? I think Forty Nine is v- v- very difficult to beat, and I'd be taking <laughs> on the Patriots because the offense just not working at the moment. Well, the Patriots are gettable this year. I don't think we should go into the f- American football in too much depth because <laughs> I, because I, 
<laughs> I'll quickly run out of gas. I I've been watching it, but it's very it looks very open this year, and the Patriots are definitely gettable. They're not the ind- indestructible force they usually are. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll be betting a little bit closer to home than that um, tomorrow night because I'm off to Kempton. Oh yeah, we, we better discuss racing, and we did actually put a couple of I put a couple of horses up last time. Yeah, superb. Yeah, one of them won. I know. Mind you, it was it was, it was it ended up at not a very big price, didn't he? Lost in translation. He won the Betfair Chase, but he did beat Bristol to me. I said something. I had to beat him eventually. You did. However, the second half of the double, Mister Whitaker just didn't turn up. We can't find out any news about that either, can we? No, I looked up Mick Shannon, the trainer's website, and the last news on there is from July or something. I like that sort of up to the minute. There's certainly no news on Mr. Whitaker. He's still in, he's in the King George where he would come up against Lost in Translation, I think. But I think his hundred to one price for the King George is about right and uh, reflects his chance. He's yeah. in the Welsh National. He doesn't strike me as that sort of horse either. No. Now you and I are both massive fans of the All Weather, and it's obviously going to Kempton tomorrow, hoping to see some decent horses. The one thing about all weather which people won't ever admit is that you get decent horses running there and the form stands up by and large well they they don't like it because it's not green punters for some reason in britain well actually not punters horse racing aficionados seem against it because it's not the right color i know it's extraordinary isn't it doesn't matter how good the horses are or the races well, there's a listed race on there tomorrow, which should be good. And then, you know, Joe Isherwood, who we covered in um, Can You Beat the Bookies podcast. Uh, I'm going with him. He's got a horse running there tomorrow called Lord Halifax. Yes, I've got Lord Halifax in my horse tracker because he has showed up in David Milnes' Gallup reports a few times that are published in The Weekender, which I like to read and take note of. So he's obviously got some sort of ability at home, even if he doesn't display it on the track. <laughs> yeah, I think he should have won a race by now. I think he's definitely got ability, and I think he should be in the first three, and unsurprisingly, he's been backed. We should say at this point that tomorrow's Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Yeah, which is might be by... <laughs> might might be over by the time anyone listens to this. No, by the time this is out, it won't be over. So, yeah, maybe we should say tonight. The, yes, I know what you mean. I love the old weather in the winter as well. And just look at the racing today, you know, the competitive... I watched a handicap over jumps at Lingfield or somewhere. So I can't remember which one. Three runners, maybe? No, there was about six runners and it looked really competitive and, you know, the... There was nothing between them and the ratings and the, everything. Any way you looked at it, it was a tight handicap. You know, the favourite sort of went off in front and the others just fell away one by one. I mean, I know you see that on the all-weather bit at Southall, but not at the other tracks. No. You get really decent competitive racing all winter. And as you say, good horses ah, well, turn up there. What was it? Enabled two-time Cartier Horse of the Year uh, made winning debut at Newcastle mm. on that brown stuff. And you can guarantee that John Gosden unleashes a lot of nice maidens at Kempton in particular. The big trainers love Kempton. Absolutely. I've always thought it's a bit weird, Kempton, because it's the wrong way round, isn't it? (laughs) What do you mean it's the wrong way round? I'm succumbing to the brown prejudice now here by thinking that if a track is brown, like the dirt tracks in America, they should all be left-handed, but Kempton... (laughs) Kempton's right-handed, so it looks a bit weird seeing Brown going that way around. Maybe that's why they're getting rid of it. Well, I think that's more to do with the housing development potential of the site, isn't it? Anyway, it's still there and well worth going. Oh, absolutely. Favourite favourite nights of mine. The only problem with the all weather at this time of year is that it's that time of year when I think, and maybe this is a bit of a myth, that smaller trainers try to raise a few bob for Christmas. Get the Christmas money on. By pulling a stunt. Some people quite like that. For me, it just throws a bit of a curveball because you're wondering if you see, especially a small yard, a horse that's being backed, you're thinking, oh, you know, what's going on here? It's just another little thing that sort of like plays away at your mind, you know? Yeah, but you never know until the money's down and then you've got to try and guess whether it's a Christmas job or not. (laughs) Anyway, while I was watching the jump racing... I noticed um, Paige Fuller, who's conditional jockey, and she she's only been professional this season, I think. I think she was a still amateur last season. She's quite literally on fire. Absolutely on fire. The place was burnt to a crisp. I mean, she did, she did a double today, and um, I had a look at her form, and she's and she's got 16 winners this season, which doesn't sound a lot, but the Strike rate. darling of the media, Bryony Frost, in terms of female jockeys, yeah, has got 26 winners, so not that much more, and exact same strike rate this season of 13%. I mean, her form in the last few days is phenomenal. A lot of people will use jockey form as one of the key 
indicators for backing this the This is my question. Is there mm. so, I mean, I always think that's a bit dumb. <laughs> is there such a thing as a jockey being in form? Well, I think it helps that the horse underneath you can run. Yes, well, obviously she had had a few of those recently. It's more likely the stable's in form, isn't it? Yeah, I think, yes. Uh, the only thing that I'd say about a jockey being in form is there's a there's a confidence factor in it, in that, you know, a lot of races, especially flat races, the margins for defeat are small and there are crucial race-winning moves that can be made. And I think if you're in good form, you might go for a gap that you maybe wouldn't have done if, if, you, if you weren't buoyant. And let's face it, there's loads of gaps in these midweek jump races, isn't there? Yeah, yeah you don't have oh, to worry too place. much about that. But um, no, I mean, I think stable being in form is a lot more important than a jockey being in form. Talking about jump racing... It's fantastic. It's still, um, what is it now? We're down to 786 days to Cheltenham. Yeah, brilliant, isn't it? I'm counting down all the way. Counting down all the way. That's the, the dual year countdown, Sean. <laughs> That's next Cheltenham after the next one. <laughs> well, I'm already, I, I'm, I'm done with the 2020 festival. I'm That's Cheltenham 2022, already. I think that is. <laughs> Well, I'm much more interested in that, I mean, because... That you know, probably is a bit exactly right for 2022, isn't it? It wouldn't be far off. Eighty-six days, yeah. Who do you fancy? Ah, oh, anyone. Lost in translation will be going for his third gold cup that year, <laughs> I reckon. And maybe Mr Whitaker will still be <laughs> going. <laughs> That's all that matters, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Anyway, yes, we'll talk about Cheltenham, nearer Cheltenham. I always think there should just be a news blackout until the day before. Well, it's a bit like Christmas, isn't it? Christmas starts in September now. Yeah, but so does Cheltenham, doesn't it? Yeah, Cheltenham starts in about a day after the, the, the festival ends. Quite often it starts during the festival because they'll quote a horse from the Supreme Novices for the champion the next year, won't they? Which is the main thing. Or after the Gold Cup, they give you the odds for him winning it the next year. I mean, the odds are that, you know... He's not going to get back there next year. Well, that's true, but you can be a bit too harsh about this. I mean, you know, when a horse wins one of the big two-year-old races, they get quoted for the, the guineas, don't they? Yeah. yeah yes, that, not... that's true. Yeah, maybe I'm being hard on them. Maybe I'm being too nice, because this Cheltenham session does my nothing. We should, <laughs> we, should like be talking, we should be talking about the King George. Maybe we'll do that next time. The other thing about Christmas is the Christmas number one, which we keep threatening to talk about but it's in such a state of flux this market the problem with it is that they keep it's much easier to release a record nowadays what you don't have to press it you mean well look at that um dwe track that i was bigging up the last time the one from the ikea advert well they put him in at about nine to two or six to one or something but now he's just d- d- virtually disappeared because <laughs> he's um yeah he's 33 to one now with some firms because New people keep popping. Storms has popped up. He wasn't in the run in two weeks ago. No. And then you've got double ups. Like Robbie Williams is four to one. That presumably must be mean any of his tracks. Yeah. Whereas Robbie Williams and Tyson Fury are ten to one. Chris Kamara's way down the, the list now. Well, and what about George Michael and or Wham? Because they're talking about re releasing last Christmas, aren't they? George Michael's gone, just Wham. So that the the, the, the George Michael one was actually meant to be that um sort of gloomy track book. Bad living and death. Obviously nice. That's, <laughs> it's not very Christmassy. So Wham, I presume, is last Christmas. is, is about Much happier boring. days. Yeah. Anyway, the most boring person in the world, apart from Ed Sheeran and James Blunt, and I'm going to retract that immediately because Ed Sheeran is not a boring person. It's just that his music is boring. Lewis Capaldi is now the favourite. Ah, That is not right for a pop star to look like that. People don't understand that you've got to be good looking and cool to be a pop star. Exactly. You can't be some fan. That lump. <laughs> imagine if imagine if Elvis or Mick Jagger or Johnny Rotten, who is now, or 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 Kurt Cobain, or <laughs> well, that fella from wrongness. Keen was a bit chubby, wasn't he? The one who yeah. got addicted to port. Port said it all, really, didn't it? Yeah, he was addicted to port. God, these guys are so boring. They're probably addicted to hobnobs or something. <laughs> The other one who I can't stand, who seems to be, you hear people playing him all the time, is that Ezra. Oh my, my that is music for people. Ah, who you've don't gone like music. on about that before. Anyway, we're glad to hear that he doesn't have a contender for Christmas number one. Thank God. Anyway, I still think it's too early to assess the Christmas <laughs> number one. Vinnie Jones is in there. Oh my God. Actually, if you if you keep going down far enough, every artist in the world is there. Well, a bit like you used to get David O'Leary quoted for every football manager's job for years yeah, after yeah. he wasn't being interviewed. I mean, is Cliff Richard in there? And Cliff Richard is in there, yes, at 50 to 1, but that's purely speculative because it's only 
two bookies. He's obviously not go- not going to have a new record out, is he? I wish I could say I could go through this, being a bit of a, a massive music fan and find some outlier that's a great bet, but it's totally confusing. They've just listed every artist who's in the charts, <laughs> plus every artist who's ever had a big Christmas hit, like Slade or 50 to 1. <laughs> Maybe if you look at the Paddy Power website, Michelle, Michelle Visage and Saffron Barker might be in it. It's it's absolutely unfathomable. It may well be that it's going to firm up a bit. There'll be a two or three contenders with a couple of weeks to go, and that's the time to look at it. Yeah, yeah. but we will. Yeah, we will. Yeah. By the way, how are QPR doing in the championship? Ah, uh, dropping like a stone, as forecast by this pundit. Yeah, well done, yeah. So they're not going to get promoted. Absolutely no chance. We do well not to be relegated. Maybe we should back them to be relegated. What price are they? Well, they're worth a second look because... Um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds, uh, it's a great feeling as a fan to know that your team is worth a second look as relegated. Really, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're winless in seven. Uh, we can't keep a clean sheet. And we're as big as 22 to 1 with Skybet and as short as 14s. Couple of quid each way. But as we discovered from our early talk about football in this podcast, teams can just sack their manager and turn the whole thing around, can't they? Well, interestingly, I think um, Mark Warburton is a good manager. And even he can't work the oracle with the shite that he's working with. So So that's a possible bet that I'm going to have a good look at that. Um, (laughs) Okay. On the on the on the early football tip thing, also I I've got to say that yet again I'm very tempted to oppose our broth this weekend. <laughs> you won't drop that bone, will you? Well, it took them two games to beat Auchin Lake Tal. It took them two <laughs> games to beat Auchin Lake Talbot in the cup. That's always a tough fixture, isn't it? No one likes going there on a cold Tuesday night. <laughs> they don't even know where it is. The the game on Saturday is um, they're at home to Dundee. Ooh, and Dundee are eleven to eight. Now, Dundee... That seems a very big price. Dundee have lost their last three games. That's a problem. But they do fancy themselves to be in the promotion picture. Yeah. And it's the time of year when bin men who play for our broth are going to be very busy, isn't it? (laughs) I think over the Christmas period, there's going to be a lot of... uh, The run-up to Christmas, there's going to be a lot of cardboard boxes from Amazon put out. Yeah. And um, during Christmas, recycling's going to be massive. Oh, that's going to be a nightmare. Our broth player's going to be exhausted. Yeah, he's going to be... Fucked. Keep taking them on. Yeah, and also, if we're going to be opposing our broth, keep mixing up your uh, recyclables with everything else just to make it really tough for him. Oh, yeah, fill your bins up in the our broth area. Put yeah. some bricks in the bottom. <laughs> and on that devastating bombshell, brick filled bombshell, we'll um, wrap up Real Gambling Review, but we'll. Um, do another one before Christmas and we'll really try and get stuck into this Christmas number one and the King George absolutely yeah start looking at the King George Sean I will do and don't put your football bets in doubles just find a nice <laughs> just find a nice 11 to 10 shot and back it yeah. well I hope you've learned that lesson Roy. I've learned I'll never do it again <laughs> until next time until next time thanks for listening and goodbye cheers bye <laughs>